morning. God is doing some amazing things uh, through the youth. And, man, they got Lee singing to them there, too, probably. Huh? No, you don't sing to them? No, oh, Maddie won't let me. oh, man. Oh, we got Maddie. There you go. You got Maddie singing. So awesome stuff happening there. Uh, so, yeah, so no encounter this. Uh, oh, there you are, Maddie. Of course we got that. So no encounter this Thursday night, uh, but we have a lot of great things going on here at Life Coast Church. We would love for you all to get involved. Uh, a lot of great things coming up, so please come out and join us, celebrate. Even if you don't have a trunk tonight, come out and celebrate. Uh, we're going to, like I said, we're going to be handing out the gospel. We're going to hand out candy. We're going to have a chance to connect with the community, so come please be a part of that. Uh, Pastor Mike's going to come out and give a great message, so we're going to pray over that real quick, and then he'll be out of here. Father God, we just thank you again so much for the opportunity to partner with you, Lord, in so many ways. God, be with Pastor Mike as he comes up here and shares the word today. Lord, speak through him, Father. Allow us to receive what we need to receive in our hearts to transform us, Father, more into the likeness of you as we partner together as your body going out to touch the community, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, good morning. How are we doing? Twelve of you are doing great. More coffee. Hey, give it up for that worship team. Good stuff. Getting in the presence of Jesus. Directing our attention to Him instead of all that we got going on. And how about that new song? It was kind of like a... Anyone else think that was like a Johnny Cash? Kind of like a bon bon. You know, like... Some of you don't even know who Johnny Cash is. But we, we know Johnny Cash, right? Oh, yeah. Good stuff, though. Thank you. Um, awesome. And if you're doing a trunk tonight, I was told to let you know it'd be nice if you got there at 4, not 4.30 or 5, because some of y'all just take a little longer, and we need you to be set up by 5.30. So if you have a more elaborate trunk, please do that. Reminder, we're in our God's Timeline series. How many have been enjoying that? Yeah, good stuff. Getting some good equipping. Here's our timeline. If you can see it, the lighting's kind of funny today, but we had Jesus, uh, his first coming. We had the cross. We're in the church age right now. Here's the you are here. If you can't see it, I'll show you. That says you are here. And then this is the rapture, the parousa of the church where Jesus comes. We meet him in the air. Somebody say hallelujah. Awesome. Get your Nikes on. And uh, then we'll have a seven-year tribulation. So we also said that before the cross, God was focusing on his people Israel. After the rejection of Christ, he's focusing on the Gentile nations and um, pulling out the church. And then he'll be focusing on Israel coming up in the seven-year tribulation. We're going to talk about that. A lot of uh, heavy stuff today. So... Um, what we want to do, we're going to talk about heavy stuff, is go ahead and do something fun first. How many parents know if you're going to do something heavy with your kids, you start out with something fun? All right? How many know we're going to get some heavy times right now if you watch the news or anything? It's kind of heavy right now. So we're going to start out with some fun. If you got your notes, what I thought we would do for fun is take and plan a church vacation, just an all-church, all-in vacation. We're going to we're going to embark upon a vacation. So we're going to take a trip. And so if you got your notes, you can take your pens or pencils and circle these. But I've already taken a sample testing of the crowd here today. I've asked 15 people which ones they would choose, where they'd want to go, what hotels they'd like to. So we're going to go down this list of what I found to be. If I chose one or if your, your comrades, colleagues have chosen one that you don't like, a preference you don't like, just say, boo, because that's what family does. We encourage each other and lift one another up. So on this trip we're going to take, I've asked again, I've asked a bunch of people, most people said they'd like to go on a church vacation to Seattle. I know, right? I was like, what? Where, anyone else say? Everybody's leaving Portland. Portland, yeah, no, we're not Portland, the rain's there. Any, any other takers before I write it up here? Hawaii. I think that was, uh, Okay. So, if you were part of the Word on Wednesday, this will look familiar to you, and that's probably why you picked Hawaii, because we, we did this to Seattle as well. So, we're going to go on a trip to, to, to Hawaii. We're going to plan this trip and go on this trip together. So, I'm going to do this quickly, and you're going to wonder, why are we doing this? Well, you're going to get tickets in the mail coming up this week. So, hold on, show me some grace here. On our way to Hawaii, we're going to plan our trip, and, and when we plan our trip, we're going to pull out our phones, 
And more people said they use droids than iPhones. Okay, so you circle iPhone. If you don't like it, you plan the trip on your iPhone. But these people said droid. And so the droid uses software like the iPhone uses Apple. The droid uses a Microsoft product, okay? Microsoft. Anyone say Windows 95? <laughs> Go Apple. Okay, so you're going to get up in the morning, you're going to choose what to wear. Some people wear Levi's, some people go on long trips and wear sweats, like champion sweats. More people than not said they wear the sweats. And we pick champion sweats. No yoga pants. <laughs> I will tell you, though, I don't wear Levi's anymore because I always get the metal detectors. So I do wear sweats myself, and they happen to be champions. So after that, I put on my either Nikes, Skechers, Vans. Nike was picked. Nobody likes Nike. Tough crowd. We're going to drive to the airport. We're going to get in our car. You're going to drive Ford or Chevy? Chevy. Chevy. You stop in to get gas at either Mobile or Exxon. Most pick Mobile. You're going to fly Delta or American because we're flying out of Daytona, and Delta was the choice. Okay, and then we're going to stay at either the Marriott or Wyndham Resorts. Most said Marriott. Oh. And then, uh, boy, when you land, you're on your way there, you need to perk up, get some coffee. You're going to perk up with either Starbucks or Seattle's Best. Starbucks was a choice. I didn't give anyone Dunkin' Donuts because I'm a donut guy, competitor. When we get to the airport, got our Starbucks, we decide to call Lyft or Uber. Most people actually said Lyft this time. But you circle which one you want, because at the end of the day, it won't matter. Now you want to eat before you get in there. You're going to go to Outback or Chili's. Most people wrote Outback. Got the Bloomin' Onion. And then with their Outback, they got either Coke or Pepsi. Most people picked Coke. And actually, Wednesday night, Moore said Coors Light. It's right to their pastor, so I wrote it down there, and it really doesn't matter in the end. Get to the, get to the hotel. You're crashing. Been a long trip to Hawaii. I think it's nine hours, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. You, you're going to get a little bit of headache, so you're going to take some Advil or Tylenol. So they picked Tylenol. And then they say, we're going to crash. Why don't we watch a movie, Netflix or Hulu? Most said Netflix. Then the hubby says, I don't want to watch the chick flick, the rom-com. I'm going to the other TV, and I'm either going to watch some news on Fox or ESPN Sports. Most said Fox. All right. So that pretty much completes it, except for you get a call. We're going to get a call that morning saying that we have to get a vaccine or a booster if you've got a vaccine. No way about it, but you love Life Coast family so much. You're looking forward to this trip. You got to get it. So you're going to pick either Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson. Most pick Pfizer. Sorry. I didn't make the mandate. Okay. So we're going to Hawaii. Anyone want to go with Pastor Mike to Hawaii? What if I took out the, the vaccine? Houston? Okay. Now I know who we're working with here. <laughs> Today, we're going to go right up into where we left off, where Pastor Jeff talked about the rapture of the church, where the church, those who are in Christ, meet the Lord Jesus in the air, 2 Thessalonians, and we'll be gone, the Holy Spirit will be gone. Then we talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you were here for that, we did a rendition of a Jewish wedding, talked about what the church is going to be doing with Jesus in the air. And then, last week, Pastor Brian brought a great message on the Bema seat of Jesus, and that is the assessment being made of all believers of all time before the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, everything that we do here in the body will be judged, whether good or bad. And that was just a great message last, last week because it taught about investing in one another. So we're going to do the same thing. Turn to somebody on your right and say, you're gold. I turn to the person on the left and say, you're silver. 
And if you're alone, you're gold and silver and precious stones. These are the things God has given us to work with here before he gets us. Amen? He gives us gifts as bridesmaids to beautify the bride. We're supposed to be investing in one another, so when he comes, as Paul says, I want to present you perfect to the bride. And that's the investment that's going to last at the Bema Seat of Christ. And so today, we're going to go to the next portion of what happens in our view of eschatology, and that is the Antichrist. So if you were with us on Word on Wednesday, we went through some of this, but I just felt like God wanted us to share it even to all of us today. It's really imperative Uh, that we understand some things about the Antichrist, not so much because we're going to be here, because I believe we're not, but because of the environment, the climate, and the condition of the planet when he comes. And we want to be in tune with that. So we're going to talk about the Antichrist. Some say he's a fictitious character. Some say that, uh, I I don't know if you've seen a study that was done about a month ago, the uh, Barna group did a study of Christians asking if they believed that Satan was real or fictitious. And 48 said he was fictitious. 28% said they were not sure. So you got over 70% of Christians today not even sure about Satan. How many know, like me, that Satan's a real dude? Because I feel him all the time. It's not just in our lives, but in this world and what's happening. And so we're going to talk about his number one compadre who's going to show up on the scene, and that's the Antichrist. And um, some people think they know who he is. Every now and then I get an email, I know who it is. <laughs> and I said, okay, tell me who he is. And, but I would say if you've been engaged in the long, couple decade long sport of Christian sport of pinning the tail on the Antichrist, don't do that. Because you don't know. You won't know. Um, And all that does is it makes people not want to study eschatology. Because everyone's popping up this one, this one, this one. It's kind of like the boy that cried wolf. We have a better mission. Amen? So, and if you do know him, you're probably in trouble because the rapture's already happened and you missed it. So, but there's over 100 references to this guy or his spirit in the Bible. And because the Bible is 100% accurate with pinpoint precision about all its prophecy, that means the Antichrist will be a real person, raised up in a real time for a real purpose, and that time could be now. So I believe, I've said this before, that we are in the last days, more now than ever, not just because chronologically we're later, because the environment and what's happening around the world. And I believe that if the Antichrist would walk out on the world stage right now during this season of chaos, turmoil, polarity, divisiveness, I believe the world would welcome him with open arms. But he can't right now because we're still here. Someone say amen. (laughs) But it's not hard to believe as we go through some of his characteristics and who he is with all the trouble, with all the problems going on, that things aren't going to get worse, and then this ruler, this leader, this guy will come in to solve the world's problems and gather a people to himself. So today we're going to look at the Antichrist, the state of the world that he's going to reign in, and I'm going to challenge you as a Christian, maybe more so than I have in a long time, because what we know about him in the environment and the blaring truth of what's going on in the world today should cause us to do some different things. It should cause us to feel a little bit more urgent about God's mission and how we live our lives. It's serious. It's heavy. But don't worry, we'll take a trip real soon together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that even though we're studying end times and we might not even be here, we thank you that you can draw truth to us, make us aware, as Jesus said, and Paul said, we're not of the darkness, we're not of the world, we're children of the light, who can be aware of things, who can discern your spirit and what's happening, not so that we can become urgent, frantic, or worrisome, 
but we can become steadfast, vigilant, missional, and very fruitful for your kingdom. So wake us up, Jesus. Call us towards you, your mission. Teach us today in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to read two passages just to start us off, and then we're going to walk through some of the characteristics of the Antichrist, and I won't make that too long. What I'm going to spend more time on is what he'll actually be doing here. So if you have your Bibles, you'll want to turn to Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, and then we're going to go to Daniel chapter 8, 23 through 25. I'll start with Revelation 13. If you need a Bible, by the way, they're free. You can have one. Just raise your hand and somebody will get one, or you can take one on the way out. Love for you to have your Bibles. All right, read or scroll along with me. Revelation 13. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And then in Daniel 8, In the latter part of their reign, when rebels had become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will rise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power, He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Someone say amen. He'll be destroyed. By God. So there's your, uh, your major passages that back up this figure, this Antichrist, and what's going to happen. He's an astounding figure. He's just amazing in his power and his dominance, his influence, his character, charisma, able to bring all together to worship him and uh, create mass destruction upon people and upon the earth. So what we want to do is, first of all, get a little bit of idea of, of who he is, his character, his personality, and, uh, and where he comes from. So first of all, if you have your notes, you can take those, off, take those out. We're going to talk about his timing first. What's the timing of his coming? Just like the return of Jesus, no one knows the time the Antichrist will appear on the scene. However, we do know is that there are a few things that need to happen before he comes on the scene. There are a few things that have to happen. The first thing that has to happen, found in Scripture in two places, is that the times of the Gentiles has to come to completion. This is this time of the church age where Gentiles are allowed into God's family, and that this has to come to completion in order for the Antichrist to come. Okay? So we said that when Israel rejected Jesus, God turns his focus to the Gentiles and the Gentile nations so that they could receive the gospel. And so the last 2,000 years, the gospel has gone out to the whole world, to the Gentile nations. And we've been living in this times of the Gentiles ever since. So when that full number of Gentiles has come into the kingdom of God and received the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the age will be over. Paul says this in Romans 11, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. He's speaking to a Gentile church saying, don't get haughty, don't get arrogant, don't be thinking Israel's gone forever. 
And when your time is done, when the full number of Gentiles has received the gospel, Israel will come back into play. Okay? So the second thing that must happen before the Antichrist comes is the one who's restraining the Antichrist has to be taken out of the way. We talked about that a few weeks ago, but just to reiterate, Paul says, for that day the coming of the Lord will not come unless the departure comes. Where we find that word, yours may say rebellion. The departure comes first, and the man of lawlessness is then revealed, the son of destruction. And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So the restrainer, the one that's holding back the Antichrist, holding back ultimate evil and destruction upon the world, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the world, will be departed from the world. And because we know the Holy Spirit is in us, I'll remind you, that means where do we go? With him, out of the world. We will be taken out of the way. So the Holy Spirit and the work he does through us, through the church, through God's children, in restraining evil and bringing goodness, the heaven of God down to earth to the time we're here will be taken out of the way. Now, if you thought it was bad now, wait till you see what happens when the Holy Spirit and us, the church, are gone. Holy fury. But it'll give us a reminder, a confirmation of just how important the presence of the Holy Spirit is while we're here. The power he has to hold back the devil and hold back evil. The confidence we should have with him in us to be able to bring forth the light through the darkness because he lives in us. There'll be a day when he's taken and we'll go with him. So, we don't know the Holy Spirit. We don't know the Antichrist. We don't know who he is, but we know two things have to happen before he comes. Fullness of the gospel preached to the Gentile nations and the Holy Spirit and the church are taken away. The next thing we want to talk about is his origin. Where is this person, where does this leader come from? Daniel 2, we, we talked about, has two visions, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. They prophesy about large empires that control the world from that time of Daniel all the way to the end of time, including Babylon, the great Medo-Persians, Greece, and the, finally the great Roman Empire. All are depicted in those two visions and with pinpoint precision. Uh, how many are part of our Word on Wednesday? Is that good stuff on Word on Wednesday? We're get digging into Daniel and finding pinpoint precision, not just for these two visions, but in, later on in Daniel, he goes through history almost with exact pinpoint uh, detail. It's just amazing what the Word of God and the prophecy of God brings to our lives today, such confidence in who God is and what he has for us. So this, the statue of Daniel 2 shows Rome at the end, the last empire, and it splits into ten toes or ten kingdoms, and then the fourth beast later on in Daniel 7 is this monster, this beast. It's not an animal that he can even describe. It's just a monster. It also has ten horns on top of it. Daniel says in chapter 7, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful, maybe like some of the nightmares you have, just this awful creature. It had large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims, trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. This is important. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little horn, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before the little horn. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the early ones. He will subdue these three kings. He will speak against the Most High, much like Paul talked about in Revelation 13. So what this tells us about the Antichrist, that he'll rise up from this Roman Empire, the last kingdom on earth, and it's going to have initially 10 powers 
Some versions say kings, 10 entities that will refine down to three entities, three powers. And finally, the one, the little horn, the last entity will subdue, uproot the three. So the Roman Empire is no longer official because it kind of dissipated from 400 AD on. It kind of petered out and people walked in, the Huns walked in. The Roman Empire actually never was conquered, just dissipated. So it's no longer here. However, there are very, uh, there's real clear indication that it's still alive because the European nations have come together over the last 30 or so years and formed a union and over the last 30 or 40 years have made decisions to start taking down walls and to join up powers and forces and to actually create a one currency called the euro. And so there's, there's a forming happen. I think there's over 36 nations that have joined and 10 who are over the decision-making powers of the European nation. Okay, so there's 10 right now, 10 large countries, 10 investors who are deciding what's going on, and the Antichrist is rooted within this Roman Empire. Who is it? I don't know. But it's rooted right in here, as Daniel tells us. So there was his origin. Somewhere out of the Roman colonies, Roman Empire, um, whether it's a king or a leader or somebody yet to come to power. His personality. We see that the Antichrist will have a very big mouth. You know anyone with a big mouth? Ever have a boss like that? Who works for me? Anyone work for me here? A big mouth. He just speaks. He's highly opinionated. He speaks boastfully. He's very arrogant. It's my way, the highway. There's no word in edgewise. When you speak, he's, he's already getting a fence ready to beat you down. It's just he's got a loud mouth. He speaks this way. And he speaks out even against God, and it says even against heavenly beings, the angels. He just spouts off. He says uh, in Revelation 13, 5, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for three and a half years, for 42 months. So within this seven-year period called the tribulation, he'll have ultimate authority for three and a half years, where he can actually blaspheme God, and others will be okay with that. So the horn with a mouth suggests this person will be a great communicator, a great orator, somebody who's impressive when he speaks, highly influential, great charisma, probably on TV all the time, maybe even owns TV, owns all the media. And he's so good that he must have People would just say he's got some hidden gifts, some hidden power behind this ability, natural ability to communicate because he's so influential. There's been many figures in our world that have been like that. We usually think of somebody like Adolf Hitler as this evil tyrant, but what most people don't know, he was an incredible communicator. Some have said he had some divine gift. Later on, we find out that he was actually connected with the occult world the occult world of the empty earth society, and he drew up demonic powers before he spoke. It's, it's listed in journals from some of his right-hand men. So there was something, not divine, but something demonic to be able to create a, a communication power that would influence many, entire countries, to back him. The Bible calls this guy imposing, attractive, uh, influential, He's impressive above the rest, it says. Do you know anyone like that? No takers? You think of a lot of impressive people out there that are great communicators. It'll be all those and all our great communicators to the 10th, 100th, 1,000th power. It'll be so amazing, unlike the world has ever seen. So what is his purpose when he arrives? Why is the Antichrist coming to town? To know his purpose, you have to understand where this guy is from. He's from Satan. He's a son of Satan. Satan's listed as the dragon in Revelation. Satan's listed as the serpent or the snake in Genesis. And the dragon or Satan gives the Antichrist power, power to be able to do all the things he was supposed to do because Satan is mad. How many know Satan's mad? How many think Satan's mad at you? Well, ultimately, he's not. Satan's mad at God. 
Because of pride, Satan was kicked out of heaven, took a third of the angels with him, now demons, and now he wants revenge. He's always wanted revenge. He's always come up alongside of the story and the people of God and the Son of God and try to divert people, distract people, uh, sway Jesus from his task because he is after God. He's got a revenge or a vendetta against God. And you happen to be in the way, being God's people. So he wants to take you out as well. So the Antichrist is Satan's son, just like Jesus is the son of the Father. And he comes to do the will of his father who is Satan. So he's working for the serpent, the big devil, okay? So his goal, his goal is to gather as many people together as he can for an army to wage war on heaven. It's little to do with worship here because plenty already worship the enemy. It's more to do how do we get back at God and take over heaven. As Jesus said, you know, if you pray, pray that my kingdom come, my will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bring the, heaven, bring the kingdom of the Father down here to, so that light may uh, break through the darkness. The Antichrist is the opposite. How do we take this kingdom of darkness up there and conquer the Father, conquer heaven, opposing? So it's not about you, although he hates you, but you're just a tool that he can use to finally get to the heavenly Father. So, everything we read about in Revelation, this is the purpose. The Antichrist, false prophet, Satan, trying to do this. How do we have ultimate revenge and get heaven back? We need to, um, we need to influence the entire world behind us and attack heaven, attack God. Okay? So here's his plan. Number one, to attack anything, anything that God's involved in, ultimately attacking God. So right now, while we're here, he's attacking us, the church, because we bring the light into his darkness. And so he wants to attack us. So he doesn't like us. Daniel says he's going to speak out against God and oppress God's people. So when you get to the tribulation, same thing. We have God's people in the tribulation. We'll talk about that in just a second. We'll have Israel in the tribulation. He's going to oppress them. He's going to speak out against them and try to destroy them for three and a half years. And attack them. But they're going to be sealed, sealed by God, so that they can't be destroyed. All right? So that's the uh, first thing to attack anything of God, especially his people in the tribulation. Number two, he's going to set himself up as God in this world and build his kingdom on earth. That's what he's going to do. It says he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God. Everything that's attached to God, he's going to exalt himself over, or anything that's worshipped, he wants to be worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple. There we have an appearance of God's holy temple here. He's going to set himself up in that temple, proclaiming himself to the world, I am now God. So in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to destroy the city of Jerusalem, take over, set himself up into a resurrected temple, and demand to be called worship. Demand to be worshipped. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew, well, the, the abomination of desolation. And then he says, blessed are those who understand these things. We can't understand these things. So if you ever think, oh, this stuff's so confusing, look into them, be praying, because God can bring them to light. The abomination of desolation will be one world ruler who will come, set himself up in God's temple, say that I now am Yahweh, and I demand your worship. That's going to happen. Number three, to form a worldwide army that will wage war on God and his son. He wants an army. He wants billions and billions to fight against God, to match with his demons, to go up against the son of God. And that's what his whole plan is. Where does he get his power? He gets his power from Satan himself. He doesn't have power on his own. Paul says the coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working, and all kinds of false miracles, false signs, and false wonders will come about. And with every unrighteous deception among those who are perishing, they perish in this time. They perish, it says, because they did not accept the love of truth in order to be saved. They didn't perish for their sins. 
They perished because they didn't accept the gospel truth of Jesus Christ. They didn't accept the gospel truth, and when you move into the tribulation, you perish because you're underneath the Antichrist. So anything Satan has shown us in the Bible, the Antichrist is going to do in the end times. Anything we've seen in Christ where the, the miracles, the signs and wonders, anything uh, through God's people where we've seen signs, wonders, or miracles, these are going to be the same, but they're going to be false. False signs, false miracles, false wonders. He even mimics Jesus' death and resurrection in Revelation 13 so that he can be worshipped as the resurrected one. So just because, just a quick tip, just because you see signs and wonders and miracles does not mean they're from Jesus. Have a discerning heart. I'm not labeling anything. I'm just saying have a discerning heart. What's coming from the Lord Jesus so we can praise him and attribute to him. So his deception is going to be sweeping. Nobody's going to escape his path. Nobody's going to escape him gathering them up who hasn't already accepted the gospel truth. That's the only way you can resist the Antichrist. And then his methods. How will all this happen? When the Holy Spirit is taken away, the Antichrist comes on the scene, and the Bible says he'll gonna, he's going to rise to power over three other powerful entities using some great influence, and the world will receive him so well. They'll just swallow it up. This, is, this guy's amazing. Because the world is in disarray. The world is going to be in turmoil. The world is going to be in chaos. There's going to be no solutions to what the world is facing and the divisiveness, the polarized sides. There's going to be no answers, and the world's going to say, who can answer these problems? Who's got an answer for these problems? If you remember, Hitler came to power because he solved a lot of problems for Germany that came after World War I. Many don't read that part of history, but he had a lot of solutions for the problems, and they let him rise up, and then they found out he wasn't who he said he was. He was actually evil. So once this Antichrist has influence, he's going to demand control of the entire world. He's going to demand worship. He's going to solve all the problems and while he's solving problems, most people won't realize he's going to be gaining influence and control all around the world. All will be deceived, it says. Now, one will escape the deception, but on earth, there'll still be resistors. On earth, there'll still be some who get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then you have the remnant of Israel that God is redeeming out of this time. So the Antichrist, he's going to devise a way to weed out Israel so that he can oppress them. He's going to devise a way to track them down, to know their location, to expose them, so he can attack them and oppress them by controlling the food source, by controlling their money and their purchasing power, by controlling where they can live and things like that. Revelation 13 says it's also forced, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave. I think that covers everyone, right? All people at that time to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had this mark. Which is the name of the beast, the Antichrist, or the number of its name? That number is 666. Anyone recognize that? How many ever got a 666 uh, like on their cash re receipt register and you're like weirded out or 666 on your credit card and you ripped it up and demanded a new one? Okay. I know who you are. So in the end times, this beast will need to do away with cash. Sound familiar? How many have heard me say, I can't even get pennies anymore for my businesses? I had like a box of pennies. I'll give you $2. $2? That's all. I mean, it's getting shorter and shorter. They're going to do away with cash money first. Then he can control the digitized currency by monitoring through computer chips, what everyone's doing, what everyone in the whole entire world is doing by placing a chip, a, B, a mark, forehead, forehead, hand, so that you have to use that mark 
to purchase anything, to open doors, to go on planes, to get into your hospital, your doctor, you have to be scanned first. And if you don't do that, people will start to starve. You can't buy food. You can't get resources. You can't get, hey, I got a farm, though. I'll be all right. You can't get seeds. You can't get anything. People will begin to starve, and he knows that because he knows that people will do anything, just about anything, before they'll watch their child starve. We've seen that all over the world. We'll do anything. Just don't let my baby starve. Here's your mark. Take it. So we are quickly moving away from a cash society into more digital currency. We're quickly moving more towards a traceable, trackable, monitorable $600 uh, currency where everything you do can be tracked. Well, what about this chip? We've all heard about chips. Some might even have a chip in their dog, in their dog or their cat or whatever else. I'm from Iowa. If your dog ran away, then somebody else is going to feed it, you know. But, you know, but we just love our animals, and so you put chips in them. And there's a company right now in Sweden called Biohacks. You may know of Dr. Osterlin, and he has already claimed uh, by January that he's injected 6,000 chips into people's hands. And he's done interviews and videos on it, you can look it up, that not just control a bank account, but also control your car remotes. It controls uh, going in and out of front doors. It, controls, it can control just about anything. You can make cars. So imagine your Apple Watch being right in here. You can make calls. You can look at text. You can do a lot of things. But it also monitors bio health. When you're too stressed, when your BP goes up, it calls your doctor for you. They call you back and give you a time to come in. When you get nervous about something, it's to wonder why you're so stressed, they start listening in. What are you stressed about? Are you stressed about something political? Are you going to start waging a revolt? They start monitoring closer and closer and closer. Maybe we should connect with this person. Shut down his buying power till we see what he's buying. Is it a gun? Oh, shut him down completely. He doesn't get food this month. Okay? So that's what this chip is already able to do. And now over 6,000 people have it. Does that scare anyone? I was like, don't say that. That's going to scare people. But i got to tell you, as your pastor, I feel like I need, to, I need to let you see some things that I'm seeing in the world so that, to better equip you for what we're supposed to do in the world while we're here. Okay? So this guy is also going to gain power by this sidekick named the False Prophet. He directs everyone on earth to worship the Antichrist, persuades them to believe, sets up a graven image of the Antichrist so you can worship him in any place, have screensaver on your phone and the image of this guy, much like the Holy Spirit does with Jesus, draws all attention to Jesus, okay? The false prophet's going to draw attention to the Antichrist. And then you have the unholy trinity of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet who will raise up an army. So once all people have taken the chip, now he can control everything about them, including their moods, their attitudes, calm them down, inject a little this or that out of that chip, and he can, he can monitor everywhere you're going and tell you where you can't go. And then he has this army he can now draw to himself who worship him, and he can wage war on Israel. Does this sound far-fetched? No, it doesn't. But do you know how close we are? Back in Daniel, it talks about three horns that came out of the ten horns of Rome. And do we see three kings rising up today? Well, not really. We see some entities. We see some dictators. We don't see any rising up in Europe like that. But what if they aren't kings? What if these powers, entities, what if they're corporations? What if, what if we're not, we're so used to looking at people and we don't look at the, what's actually happening in the globe today? And when that happens, you start opening your eyes a little bit. You know, there's a few corporations that currently have more money than 90% of all countries on this globe. Just three corporations own more money than over 90% of the countries on this globe. Chase, BlackRock, 
Vanguard, you ever heard of those? You might even invest in some of those. Maybe you got a chase card. Those things are heavy. Got a chase card. You got some investments in there. They've been doing investing for decades. They've been investing all right. They've been taking over for decades. They've controlled much of the shares of all publicly traded companies in the world. Three horns started with State Street, Chase, then BlackRock, who owns most of the land. And then currently, over the last 10 years, one horn has risen up above them all, Vanguard. I remember I was 20 years old and somebody said, get yourself a Vanguard, 15%, you'll be a millionaire by your 40. I'm sure there are a lot of millionaires. I didn't, I didn't listen. <laughs> but they've been doing this for a long, long time. And so Vanguard has now risen to the top. BlackRock is now at second. Do you know that these two companies own between themselves and all their subsidiaries that they own, over 80% of shares of all publicly traded companies. 80% of every company that you use that's publicly traded is owned by Black, uh, and by Vanguard or its subsidiaries. The number one investor, investor in BlackRock is Vanguard. They own BlackRock. So when you go on and say, who's a major shareholder of dot, 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 you'll see Vanguard or BlackRock and all the other subsidiaries, they're the major investors in. One company ruling over them all. When you talk about companies, it sounds so general, so let's just put it down to where it is. Every, every piece of clothing you buy comes from a company, most of them publicly traded. So your clothing, the restaurants you go to, the, the um, professional teams you root for, the car companies you buy from or rent from or lease from, computer companies that you're purchasing and using, all their software, Microsoft, Apple software that you are using, biohacks with chips in, in, in uh, wrists and foreheads, pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, social media companies, every single one of them, Google, Facebook, and you just name them, all media companies, TV, all TV channels, news, movies, Disney, Paramount, most, mostly, soon to be all, all of these will be owned by one corporation who has the eyes to see everyone and the mouth to communicate exactly what it wants to every single person on the planet. Kind of scary, huh? So big is Vanguard's assets right now that they're now topping $20 trillion. Do you know what our budget, do you know all the money in the U.S. right now sits at $19 trillion? One company has more money than the United States of America. And then they own most of the companies. And they own the government. And the president. And the last president. Blue, red, in between. With a lobbyist. The corporations that come in, all decisions are made because the love of money is the root of all evil. How does that affect us? Well, let's take our trip. You decided we're going to Hawaii. That's awesome. I want to go to Hawaii. Been there. It's beautiful. You're going to use a droid. Guess who owns droid? Vanguard. Guess who owns Microsoft? Mr. Bill Gates. Vanguard. Guess who owns Champion Sweatpants or Levi Strauss, whatever one you were picking, Dockers, The Gap, Vanguard. Guess who owns those shoes you put on today? Vanguard. Guess who owns that car that you drove? Chevy, Vanguard, and Ford. Mobile, Exxon, Vanguard. Delta, American, Vanguard. Marriott, Wyndham, Vanguard. Get your coffee, better go to Swillerby's. We're not owned by Vanguard. Starbucks, <laughs> Vanguard. <laughs> we're not giving in until we're taken away, and then who knows. Lyft, Uber, Vanguard, Outback, get your steak, or Chili's, or many others, Vanguard. Coke or Pepsi, or even Coors Light, Coke, Pepsi, you name it, Vanguard. Tylenol and Advil, Vanguard, Netflix, or Hulu, Vanguard. Fox, yep, Vanguard, CNN, yep, Vanguard, ESPN, Vanguard, Pfizer, Vanguard, Johnson & Johnson, Vanguard. Guess who not just monitored but helped control our entire trip to Hawaii? 
And every time you plan a trip, they're watching. With over $20 trillion, they have a section of their company that watches everything you do, where you're going, and they can divert if they need to. Oh, there's no flights available because they don't like where you're going. That's what trillions of dollars will do for you. Kind of scary, huh? One company can already trace everything we do and in some degree control everything we do. And behind these companies are just a few families. You've heard of them. Ever heard of the Rothschild family from England, from Scotland, actually? Uh, Rockefellers, Vanderbilts, still the major players. Behind this company, the top three especially, who are currently behind the big push for the Great Reset, where we redistribute wealth, that way we can tr control it better and protect what we have, where we can flip the script and make things very chaotic so that we can solve problems, where we can monitor and trace everyone and make sure that everyone minds their keeps their ducks in a row just like we need them to, and make sure we take out those who don't. Enter the Antichrist. The climate is ripe for this guy. We are not that far away. Money will soon be digitalized globally. There's a globalization happening right now before our eyes. Tracking's already begun. Are you ready? Are you ready to go? Okay. The one thing I want you to know before we get to the next steps is this is the Antichrist, but his spirit is already here. 1 John 2 and 4 talks about the spirit of the Antichrist. It's already here and ripening the environment for his coming. You can see it out there, not like you think, not just always in evils like sex trafficking and these things, but sometimes in just divisiveness and judgmentalism, okay, in aggressive behaviors, in some revolting. There's just an aggravation rising and rising, and some of us pull play right into it. That's the spirit of the Antichrist is right here. Getting the environment ready for his coming. All right, next steps. How do you pull next steps out of this? Gloria, how do you pull next steps out of this? I, and you know, like, well, we're going to go home and just, what do we do with this? First thing I want to tell you as your pastor is don't live in fear. Do not live in fear. Not just because we won't be here. But who has all this under their control? If he wrote about it 2,500 years ago to, with precision detail, he knows what's happening, and he says, Lo, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's right here. God is here. If the, Antichrist, if the coming of the Antichrist is close, that means for us in the church, the coming of Christ is even closer. Bring it on, Jesus. Okay? So, you can either worry or you can worship. Let's worship the Savior and stop fearing. Number two, don't live in the spirit of the Antichrist. It's already here. Don't get swallowed up into the spirit of the Antichrist. I heard it said that the religion of the Antichrist is an ABC religion. Anything but Christ. Anything in your life that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ is already a spirit of the Antichrist. That includes purposes, aspirations that don't have to do with his kingdom. It also includes distractions. It also includes a loose lifestyle that has nothing to do with Christ. You rarely hear us say it, but I'm going to say it. Stop living loosely for Jesus. Don't get involved in all sorts of things that are going to distract you, unfocus you, get you all disoriented when things happen. We need to be vigilant and getting in the spirit of God. We need to put things off, off our plate. We need to put sins off our plate. We need to say, look, I need to stop doing this. It is distracting me, destroying me, and not making me healthy for this time right here. Amen. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. And too many of us are involved in it. Me too. I look back over my week and say, I don't know why I was doing that. Anyone else say that? That was not fruitful. I don't think Jesus wants me doing that. Lord, let me wake up today and only be about your stuff, not the spirit of the Antichrist. We need to be vigilant because we're living for Jesus Christ. 
This is why he came. to Give us that power to live the light of Christ. We don't want to be worldly living. We want to be living on mission. And number three, what's that mission? People, we got to live out the gospel. We've been given the jewel of all eternity, the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has called you and me for this hour, this season, right here. This is nobody else's calling. It's our calling. Oh, it's pastors, elders. Uh -uh Uh-uh-uh. We're all going to the Bema seat. He's going to say, I called you for that hour yesterday. If he calls us tomorrow. What what were you doing? We have the gospel mission right in front of us. And it's more urgent now than ever. Hopelessness and despair is more prevalent now than ever in this world. And that is what we have is the real answer, not the answer that the evil guys got. We've got the real answer for them. If we're going to be at the wedding feast, it might be tomorrow, might be next month, it might be next year. I don't know. But if you and I are going to be at that wedding feast with Jesus Christ, would you want somebody to miss that? Would you want somebody in your house to miss it? Because you didn't share the gospel, your neighbor, how'd you like to stand before Jesus and him say, you know, I put you in the L section, I put you in the B section in that particular neighbor, I had a broken lady next door, Uh, how come you neglected to share the gospel I gave you? Because she could be here with you. And I know Jesus, he's sovereign, he says, and she is, because despite you, I brought her here. But I don't want to hear that. I want to see somebody there with me, with you, that we brought along with us. And this is the climate. This is where we're at right now. People are looking for the answer, for the hope in Jesus Christ. People, we have to be ready to give it to them. And that means we've got to clean some things up, get focused, get directional, and say, I know my mission. And when it comes in front of us, we we give it out. We see the open door. Spirit guides us, directs us, and we obey. David Jeremiah says, every time a believer shares the gospel, the demons lose their power. Let's go disempower some demons this week. Let's do some of that. Let's kick some in in the teeth and say, the gospel won again. The gospel won over my neighbor, my workmate, my workout partner, my wife, my son. We're going to be at the wedding feast. We're going to see people saved. Because we decided now's the time. Everyone stand with me. We're going to pray, and I just want to remind you, as we've done each week, the only way you get to avoid the influence of the Antichrist is by knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. So as you're praying, you can just simply reach up and say, God, I want to know you. I want to know you. Jesus is my Savior. Surrender my life to you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that every message, every truth that comes out of the Scripture is so powerful for our lives today. And even though what lies ahead might be a 